The competition for strategic advantage in economic and military affairs depends more and more on critical materials. Now the Energy Department has launched an initiative it calls the Critical Materials Collaborative. Among its goals, to accelerate a domestic supply chain for critical materials. For more, we turn to the Senior Technology Manager for the Energy Department's Advanced Materials and Manufacturing Technologies Office, Helena Kazdozian. Ms. Kazdozian, good to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Let's begin with the basics here. What materials are we talking about? Is it lithium to put in batteries, or or does it go way beyond that? It definitely goes beyond that. So actually, just um, this summer, we released a new critical materials assessment um, looking at what materials are critical for the clean energy transition, um, both the short and medium term. Um, so we think about those in a couple different material classes. We have the earth elements. Um, these are generally used in magnets for wind turbine generators and electric vehicle motors. Um, We have the battery materials, uh, you know, for the lithium ion batteries, um, so lithium, cobalt, nickel. We have uh, semiconductor materials, uh, you know, silicon, gallium, uh, silicon carbide that are used in uh, solar photovoltaics, um, efficient lighting. Uh, We have lightweight materials, so like magnesium and silicon and aluminum are used in alloys uh, to lightweight vehicles. Um, We have platinum group metals used for clean hydrogen. And then we also have um, copper and electrical steel on the list. These are pretty ubiquitous materials, but are especially used in uh, transformers and uh, motors for electrical grid and also for, for powering energy. All right, so that's a pretty comprehensive list. Is it fair to say or accurate to say that quite a number of these are in abundance in places elsewhere than the United States? Yeah, certainly, uh, you know, we have some of the materials here in the United States. Um, other materials, uh, you know, are concentrated in other countries, like cobalt, uh, pretty notably uh, concentrated in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Right. And a lot of them are in China, too, aren't they? That's right. And there is also the initiative that China has called Belt and Road, where they're trying to get access to the minerals and materials in countries like the Congo throughout Southeast Asia and so forth, where they make investments. That's going on, fair to say? Yeah. And I think more than just controlling the upstream mining of materials, um, a lot of the processing is actually concentrated in in China. And so that's a part of our strategy as we're building out the domestic critical material supply chains is making sure that we have the capacity to refine and process these materials. Otherwise, if you just mine the materials, you'll have to export them, right? You won't be able to keep them in the United States and support the manufacturing these. All right. So tell us more about this initiative, the uh, Critical Materials Collaborative. What form does it take and, and uh, you know, what is the uh, what is the activity that it's actually doing? Yeah, absolutely. You know, this has really been, I think, a long time coming. You know, we first had our, our first uh, critical material strategy in 2010. It's the first time we assessed what materials are critical. It uh, enabled us to start thinking more strategically about uh, what, what our investments look like. So we had investments in the Critical Materials Innovation Hub, or CMI, that used to be called the Critical Materials Institute. They've been operating for a decade, doing early stage research. At the same time, uh, we had a program looking at producing birth elements from uh, coal-based feedstocks. So can we transform, uh, you know, this mining waste into a resource in the United States? But this is kind of the first time the department's thinking about how do we align all of these into some shared goals, right? And it's really important now because we are sitting here uh, over 10 years later with over $8 billion um, from the bipartisan infrastructure law for critical materials provisions to build out actual supply chains, right? Commercial facilities. We have the Inflation Reduction Act with tax credits also to incentivize that production, manufacturing and recycling. So we, we have kind of a gap right now. We have all this applied R&D, really cool innovation happening, and we have deployment happening, but we don't have the connective tissue to get that innovation into the world. And if we're going to be globally competitive, we really need to be innovative, right? We, we need to reduce the costs of these technologies. We want to reduce the environmental and health impacts while increasing the efficiency and the circularity of the materials. So that's kind of what we're trying to do here. Uh, we want to be that connective tissue to really accelerate the uh, adoption of these uh, critical materials innovations into the um, into the supply chain as it's being built out. But we also want to be building out the innovation ecosystem around that, right? It takes uh, uh, researchers of all kinds from different sectors, national labs, academia, industry. Sure. So, so we're really trying to align um, what we're doing in the department with other agencies and with the research community so that we're, you know, 
trying to achieve a shared set of goals. We're speaking with Helena Kozdozian. She's Senior Technology Manager for the Energy Department's Advanced Materials and Manufacturing Technologies Office. So a couple of questions. Is there the belief, I mean, surely the processing capabilities are totally within the power of the United States to develop and do. But what about supplies where there simply aren't that much availability of the basic material? Or is the thinking that we've got the material if we wanted to be better at mining, better at finding it in large amounts of ore or whatever the case might be, that we actually could become self-sufficient? Is that part of the thinking? So I think the idea that the United States could be self-sufficient for all critical materials uh, is probably not realistic. We do need to, you know, work with uh, allied countries to to source some materials. But it's not just looking at unlocking, you know, new mines. There's lots of other things we can do, right? So we actually have um, one of our offices looking at, you know, mining of the future program to to look at really surgical approaches to um, to remove materials from the earth in a way that doesn't leave a new legacy of mining waste in the United States really looking to improve the sustainability of those practices, but also looking at unlocking the mine waste, right? Maybe we can achieve 50% of, of our needs from these, even though they're low concentrations, can we look at innovation to get them out? We also look at actually reducing our need, our reliance, right? So you can actually try to engineer out the materials, you know, and I've been doing that in batteries for a long time with cobalt, and there's lots of examples of that. Can we actually make sure we're being good stewards, increase the efficiency of the, you know, how we're processing these and then looking at circular economy, right? And extending the lifetimes of those materials in use. And eventually they'll have to be recycled, right? Want to be positioned to that as well. So it's really a, a diversified approach that we take in the Department of Energy. And with the money you have, you will be then doing what? Issuing research grants or creating incentives for industry? What form will the work take to create that connective tissue? Yeah, so within the CMC, uh, we won't be, uh, it doesn't have any money on its own. What it does, it's aligning the offices that are competing out research to coordinate. To be a member of the CMC, you want to go out and uh, compete for for funds, but then we'll have lots of opportunity to engage, and I can talk more about what that will look like. But right now on the streets, we have two funding opportunities. One is through the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. It's $150 million really to advance R&D um, and and really thinking about, like, how can you translate that basic discovery into R&D as well as scaling it up? And then we also have, in my office, the Advanced Materials and Manufacturing Technologies office, we have a critical materials accelerator program on the streets. And that's really thinking about prototyping, maturing new technologies, kind of de-risking that step before you can go to a big, uh, a bigger pilot. The CMI is a big part of the CMC as well. This is, again, 10 years standing, a really robust innovation ecosystem and engine all on its own. So we'll be able to learn from their experience as well. So that's how to be a member is, you know, go out to funding that's being coordinated through the CMC. You must collaborate with some of the other federal agencies, as you mentioned. I imagine commerce maybe might have a big part of this and Defense Department? Yeah, you know, we just started the CMC. We launched it in September, or we're still getting our footing underneath, but we will have other agencies engaged. Certainly, the Department of the Interior, NSF, DOD, wherever there's research alignment, we want to have active engagement, but we'll certainly continue to coordinate with other agencies that help set the policy framework, right? So we understand the context. Given the prevalence of some of these minerals in places that are we'd rather not be concentrated, what about some of the other NATO allies or Canada, Mexico, maybe even South America, where access might be more assured, at least than it might be in China, if, just, if China decides, well, no more cobalt for you, no more lithium you know, for you. Are other nations maybe part of this alignment? Yeah, the United States uh, engages in a lot of different international engagement. We work through the International Energy Agency ministerials to coordinate with other countries. We have bilateral agreements with Canada and Australia and, and I think Brazil as well. The State Department has the Mineral Security Partnership Initiative that's getting going. Um, I'm not an expert on the international front, but certainly we do coordinate with other countries. And by the way, what is your background that you bring to this? Are you primarily a program type of federal person or are you a materials and manufacturing person? I think myself as, as a technologist, my background is in electrical engineering. I get my PhD at Iowa State. I was at the Ames Laboratory for a couple of years before coming to DOE as a AAAS fellow and then stayed on what was used to be the Advanced Manufacturing Office, now AMTO, to continue to work on critical materials. I've been working on this issue for about 10 years. I started researching this topic when I was in my, my graduate studies. 
Interesting. Well, we're glad you're on the job. We should say Dr. Helena Kozdozian.